thank you, Richie and Lisa, for joining me today um, to explain at the start of this who, who we all are. Uh, my name is Helen Thorne. I'm the business manager for Identify Office Professionals, which is one of three divisions within Identify Global. And we work in recruitment support verticals within specific target specific sectors, such as um, legal tech and legal services. Uh, a lot of the reasons behind that is due to, to the vast growth within the market um, and really the, the, the new way of working um, and where we can support in the right ways. But what we're also looking to do, um, as we discussed previously, is um, look at uh, creating some series of podcasts that very much focused on this new working world of how we can look to support our teams, um, not only the culture of our teams, but also their, their welfare, their mental health, and also how that impacts on our business as a whole um, moving forwards as, as we, we adapt to all these changes. Um, from our, our meeting uh, last week, I've found out quite a lot more about each of you guys. So um, if I could ask Richie first, if you wouldn't mind just explaining kind of what you do within Amicus, um, your, your position and so on, and give us a bit more of an insight into the service and, and the profile of Amicus as a whole. And Lisa, if you wouldn't mind adding in then your areas of responsibility as well, that'd be fab. Thank you. Yeah, um, so Amicus uh, were started um, five years ago. Um, we are a um, digital uh, identity verification software company. Um, so we essentially make automated software that allows um, companies to do anti-money laundering checks, staff onboarding, things like that um, through a fully automated solution. So we plug into a number of different data sources to do things like ID verification, uh, criminal record checks, credit checks, um, and other sort of anti-money laundering uh, measures. Um, my role within Amicus uh, is head of people. Uh, I've been with the company two years, uh, and I suppose my responsibility is to make sure that um, the people function and the people who work for the company are um, are happy and um, the the cultures maintained and yeah everything runs smoothly i suppose ultimately absolutely and lisa if i can ask a bit more about your role within amicus of course yeah so um my name's lisa mahoney and i well the majority of my role is focused on actually for marketing at amicus uh but given i have a, a big passion for wellness and have studied it quite heavily over the years um when I joined Amicus about a year ago or just over a year ago, I really wanted to kind of bring that with me and just saw an opportunity for us to uh, improve what was already created. Um, we have a really great culture at Amicus, definitely centered around, uh, you know, it, making sure that people are happy, making sure that people are well. Um, I just felt that there was more that could be done. And so I've kind of started to take the lead on, on wellness about a year ago um, and I've obviously continue to do so now so Richie and I kind of work together on that aspect of, of the business now and um, yes so that's kind of where we're up to at the moment. So how many staff work for Amicus? Uh, so we're just under 30 at the moment. Okay and we talked before they're, they're quite spread out as well aren't they? So we're at what locations then? Yeah, so our, our office is um, headquartered in Edinburgh, but we have um, a team are really spread out throughout the UK, yeah. um, Cambridge, uh, Cheshire. Um, we've got uh, someone in Belfast, um, a couple of different locations in Scotland as well, and one of our engineers works in Lisbon in Portugal. Um, so yeah, we, we've got um, a bit of a, a spread. Absolutely. and. But prior to lockdown, were were they based between offices and home working? So yeah, prior prior to lockdown, we had probably approximately about thirty to forty percent of the team worked remotely anyway, um, yep. and we've all, always um, had uh, or offered sort of flexible working uh, options to the team. So even uh, the team in the Edinburgh office, quite often people would do you know two three days from home. Um, so we've always um, offered that option, um, but obviously during lockdown that's became less of an option and more of an <laughs> enforced thing. Very much so. And Lisa, you've, you've said about introducing kind of the support, the welfare focus. Um, 
again, how how has that been developed with them? What kind of um, ideas have been created off the back of the support that you've put in place? Yeah, so it, it's been a bit of a journey and I think it will continue to be. Um, obviously, we, we're involving what we're doing over time based on how the how the people of the company react. And we have the benefit of having a very small company where we can really pay attention to what people need and what people are responding well to. Um, so it kind of started with the introduction of what we called Wellness Wednesdays. Um, and that was essentially me taking the team over Zoom through um, you know, a number of wellness topics and activities. So it could have been anything from you know, a breathing exercise to reduce anxiety to a yoga session or a, a, you know, a discussion around um, how, how people are feeling or it could have been um, sometimes it was just kind of a debate around our approach to certain things. So I'm just trying to think off the top of my head now as so we've talked a little bit about like imposter syndrome and things like that. So it was like a 20 minute session every Wednesday. And, um, you know, we kept that quite consistent for a while. And then I think just as things have moved on and, you know, there is a certain amount of, um, you know, once people have kind of gotten used to things, perhaps they're just, they, they need something a bit more or, so we decided to evolve it. And we especially wanted to evolve it away from my management. So we now have a team of people that are involved in wellness, um, a committee. And it's important that we have that because otherwise, you know, we're only talking about one perspective, my perspective, which obviously I like my own perspective, but maybe it's not necessarily going to um, be representative of what the team wants. So, um, yeah, so now it's kind of evolved more into this committee approach. We'll have different roles. We set wellness challenges. We draw attention to things that the team have been doing over the week to kind of look after themselves. Yeah. Um, and it's all it's all kind of ticking along quite nicely. And, you know, with the latest thing really is that our what was originally our kind of Wellness Wednesday internal Zoom session is now become an external podcast. So that's actually launching this week as well. Um, so that's our own like Wellness at Work podcast. Absolutely. Okay. And you, you've mentioned about so you were leading it previously. So it's, it was your mindset on on what was right. So as it's evolved, how how has it been received and how have you had an engagement from the workforce? Um, well, I think, Richie, perhaps in a moment you could talk a bit about the um, the engagement survey, because I think that's probably been quite telling. Yeah. Um, I think the one of the key things that's come out of it is actually like it's been it's lovely that everyone has everyone's had access to this thing and you know I'm a mental health first aider as well so I, I take responsibility of it because I'm passionate about it but clearly that's not the best strategy for a business long term if I were to leave for example or if I was unwell or anything like that then that would kind of just disappear as a function yeah. um, so that was the idea of creating it as a committee and then I think kind of the next level for us which um, we're working towards now is all about it coming from leadership which I think is incredibly important and you know, whilst lead, leadership has always been very supportive of what we're doing and really, you know, gotten involved in everything, I think it needs to be driven from the top at this stage. And just to make sure that we are actually having that consistency across the team and not focusing on like four or five people that are passionate about wellness. OK, thank you. So, Richie, what, what's the engagement survey all about? Uh, yeah, so we, we do... Uh, um a bi-annual um, engagement survey with the team. So basically a, a bit of a sense check across the team of uh, how they're feeling about things. So um, I think this time there was approximately about 40 different questions, um, you know, and score them on a rating. Um, but yeah, with with things such as culture, well-being, um, how, they're, how they're rating leadership, communication, um, I suppose just looking at giving people a a voice and uh, making sure that as a leadership team we're kind of listening to people and trying to take things on board. Um, so we started that a couple of years ago, but um, they tend to be um, really positive. Uh, and also it's a great way of, um, I suppose, improving and um, finding out, you know, what, what the team feels. But the response specifically about the um, the well-being work that Lisa had done was really, really well received, really positive. That was one of the highest marks that we got was um, was around about the questions on um, the sort of well-being work and the culture. 
Absolutely. Wonderful. So looking at the business as we've kind of navigated through lockdown and, and the new ways and ways we've had to adapt within the situation, what would you say has been your biggest people challenge during the pandemic? Um, I think actually for us it's been, well, there's a couple of things. So it's been much more around engagement of people and making sure that people are, are happy and having fun. Um, obviously, those people in the company that have were previously based in the office, they signed a contract to be in an office. That was the environment that they were expecting, the environment they've signed up for. And obviously, everyone is incredibly understanding of the fact that we can't do that right now. But equally, I think it's the responsibility of, of Amicus to um, make sure that the connections which would have been facilitated in an office environment can kind of continue. Um, you know, there are there are a number of people in the company. I mean, obviously, in various different situations, there are people that have children, people with wealth. There's a lot of pets in the company. Um, there are certain people that are on their own, like myself included. So it's a case of making sure that we are understanding all of those different challenges and finding ways that kind of transcend all of those to bring everyone together. So we worked really hard, actually, on things that could just be easily slotted into our day-to-day -day lives um, and like little just fun little challenges so I think it's just been about creating we, we released an article actually in the beginning of lockdown about creating um, creating an environment that's fun not just functional I think a lot of businesses have gone down the functional route yeah. we were in, we were in a luxurious position that we had the functions kind of going already so we could focus on the fun um, so some of the, the most popular things we've done have been really simple. Um, I think that the, we, we started a challenge called Amicus Radio. So every week we set a, a theme and then we have a collaborative playlist on Spotify and we all just submit a song on that theme. And we yeah. announce it, uh, we, we take a vote, we announce the winner on the following Monday and that person sets the theme for the following week. I think that's been our most successful, consistent thing that we've done. And it's just like something a bit silly and fun. It gets conversation going in, in the Slack channel. Like music's obviously something that people can connect on quite easily, regardless yeah. of their situation. Um, so I think that in particular has been great. And I know it sounds like such a simple thing, but it's those simple things that have made the biggest difference, I think. Yeah, I completely agree. As, as a company, we try to adopt um, ways and means of not only engaging individuals but keeping that team mentality um, initially prior to furlough when we were working from home we we had a recruitment bingo daily um, and weekly so again there was still that level of a, a healthy competition but it just helped to engage um, and give a bit of focus to, and that's not so kind of dictated by kind of KPI measures and things like that but just more on achievement and and self-motivation as well so Certainly from that point of view, um, I, I completely understand the importance of, of that fun element um, because it's a very serious situation we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, and to Richie, what kind of key things would you say, aside from kind of like the, the yogas and, and the sessions and things like that, that you'll do differently with the workforce um, in lockdown that's different from other businesses? I suppose it, well, hard to say what's different from maybe other businesses, but yeah. um, I think one of the one of the big positives for me, we we probably had a slight advantage over a number of organisations because we did already have um, ourselves. We were already set up to support remote working. We already had probably fifty percent of the team. Um, sorry, I've just there's a delivery driver at the door <laughs> waving at me. <laughs> Um, yeah, we already had sorry, fifty percent of the or forty percent of the team working remotely. So we were, we already had things geared around supporting that that sort of work with the tools that we were using. Um, I think one one uh, big advantage um, from this is I always felt there was a slight struggle as we we would talk about supporting remote work, but we had an office and probably we were still quite focused around about office work and um, so this has really given everybody in the company a perspective from our remote workers about what it's like for them every day and i think that will be a huge benefit for us moving forward um i i, I suppose that's not um I, perhaps not answered your question that's not something we're necessarily doing differently 
Um, but I think, yeah, that, that's probably the, the, the biggest um, positive I think that will come out of this for us longer term is just the the understanding now of the challenges our remote teams face. And it, it really, we used to describe ourselves as being remote first. And sometimes our remote workers would say, well, we're not really remote first because we're office first. And then we help out remote workers. And I think this has really sort of changed our dynamics and changed the way that we'll, we'll approach things. Excellent. Lisa, you mentioned earlier about um, passing over the, the wellbeing programme onto the leaders and so on. So what, what does good leadership mean within your business, within Amicus? I think that the simple answer is it's about trust and it's one of our core values as a company um, regardless. And I and it's, you know, a lot of other companies I've worked for, they've had their kind of their values and they've had them sort of like pinned on the wall. And a lot of the time they're quite meaningless. But I think within Amicus, they really do mean a lot. They genuinely um, support the way that we function as a business. Um, they guide us. And it certainly feels that there is a, a strong um, intention for us to have a sense of trust between colleagues, but also from like myself to obviously from my boss. And I think that transcends across all of the teams in the company. Um, and I think that trust comes from consistency, um, obviously really clear communication. And we're at a time right now where everything is uncertain. You know, we have zero um, certainty in our lives. And that's for, for everybody. And one of the things that I really appreciated with Amicus is at the time when obviously when things locked down, whilst I was quite confident that there wouldn't be, um, people wouldn't be furloughed and, and things like that, the fact that the I think that it was probably not um, seen as ideal by some of our investors that we decided not to furlough anyone and, and we still haven't. It certainly paid off for us that we that we didn't do that. And I know that the the reason that we didn't do it was purely around creating this sense of trust um, and not breaking that trust and making sure that, um, you know, that there wasn't any abuse of the furlough system, which has obviously been uh, the case in a lot of other companies. Um, yes. And it, it was just something that I massively appreciated. And I think it just, for me, it, in a time when things are so uncertain, as particularly in a company um, when you're working from home, that it, it com becomes your life. You become very consumed by your, your work. You are going to look to your leaders in your company for that sense of certainty that doesn't exist elsewhere. Um, and I think Amicus has been able to create that quite nicely for for the majority. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I was just going to add, add uh, on to that. One of the things Lisa touched on there about the communication, that, that was something that I felt um, the team did quite well. So at the very start of lockdown, um, there was a, an emergency response team put together to basically analyse the government advice every day and provide an update on if that affects anyone in the company. You know, this is what we would advise you do. This is our take on things. And again, as Lisa said, to sort of to reassure people, you know, we'll try and support you as much as we can. Or, um, you know, if, if you're affected by this, let us know and we'll see what we can do. Um, and again, on the, the feedback that we received from the team, that was um, really well received. And I, th I thought, um, it, it wasn't a, a big thing, you know, actually it was like a 10 minute meeting in the morning just to assess, but I think it, it just let people know that they, are, they were being thought about and um, yeah. they were being considered. So, yeah, I, I think that was a real positive that we did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think those, those touch points are, are so key, aren't they? Um, it, even if it's a, you're all right, you want to have a quick coffee. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be so KPI focused and things like that just to make sure that, that people are right out there. So on that note, is, and to both of you, because I know you've obviously each got very different roles, um, what kind of difficulties have you had or challenges when re-engaging staff, I know you didn't furlough, but bring them much more to the forefront? So have you had any problems or any, any hurdles that you've had to overcome? Um, there. I can't think of any sort of major hurdles, you know, that we face sort of wholesale. I suppose there's always sort of individual 
things and individual difficulties. And as Lisa touched on, you know, a lot of people had different situations um, that we had to deal with. Um, I think because um, we didn't furlough anyone, there has been quite a consistent approach throughout um, and the the service has kind of carried on um, reasonably unaffected. We had a couple of difficult months, um, obviously, when everything was locked down, but since um, probably end of May, start of June, things have really been picking up. And I would say, certainly within the team, it's been really positive. Um, so perhaps we're in a fairly fortunate position there, because I know, obviously, that it's been very different for a lot of businesses. Um, but I can't think of anything, I suppose, major um, due to the sort of fortunate position we were in, being able to kind of keep the team fairly steady. I don't know, Lisa, you might, you might have something yeah. else. Um, no, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think that there's been there's been a lot of consistency and, and that's really, really paid off. Um, in terms of the, the hurdles, I think probably, you know, similar to what, to what anyone's experiencing, there are, you know, there was a period of time when Zoom fatigue was, was causing some issues for people. And obviously our company is quite used to delivering things over Zoom calls, but what we weren't used to was then interacting on a social level over Zoom calls, like all the time. So, you know, there was a period of time when we were all, everyone was doing Zoom quizzes and things like that. And I was obviously fully into that too. We did our own Zoom quiz. We did a number of other things as well. We did like a magic show. We did um, charades and we, we tried lots of different things that worked really, really well. I think what became clear very quickly is people did not want to be on their computers for their lunch breaks, for their social time. And that was one of the reasons that we changed our wellness program is we couldn't make it um, just about being at your desk. So obviously the Zoom calls that we were doing required people to be sat at their desk for 20 minutes. Um, well, didn't necessarily need to be at their desk, but it would have probably been quite awkward for them to be out in, in the open on a walk, etc. And so we wanted to change it so that we were encouraging people to get away from the desk and move towards like the audio um, and podcast style of doing things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that's been the, the biggest thing I perhaps noticed in terms of the specific like well-being exercises that we've done. It's been very much like let's move away from Zoom and, and do other things. Um, okay. yeah. yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think I say uh, the term Zoom fatigue very much pinpoints kind of way it, it just drains you after a little while and again I guess that process of adapting to, to working in a new environment is it's challenging it really is and again I know that you've mentioned that uh, you were very much well set up for remote working but have you had to introduce any new ways to measure things like KPIs with with the workforce or have the leaders had to, to adapt in any way with the KPIs? Um, we we have introduced some new ways of working, although I wouldn't necessarily say it was, was due to um, sort of COVID. Um, yeah. We tend to kind of try things and I suppose fail quickly. And uh, so we have adapted. We did work through um, a system called OKRs um, and we've sort of evolved, evolved these out over the last sort of six to 12 months and now introduce some new KPIs. But again, we, we always had um, the the sort of KPIs and OKR set up around about remote working. And um, so we have uh, con continued that essentially. So it hasn't been a, a huge change for us, um, but we have introduced some, some new ways, but as I say, not necessarily due to COVID. Yeah, okay. And just slightly away from um, the welfare culture side of things, with everything that's going on, I know it's very uncertain, but how do you see this situation with with the pandemic and even Brexit to, to that degree um, affecting your, your industry going forward? Do you anticipate any major change or improvements or any any areas that, that may be different? Yeah, well, interesting. I was just uh, listening to the government updates at lunchtime there and it looks like Unfortunately, there'll be tighter restrictions yeah. and things coming uh, back into force. Um, from a business point of view, our software allows people to engage remotely, um, such as lawyers, accountants, estate agents. Um, so 
I, I think not just for ourselves, but this has kind of shone a light on you know the use of technology and that companies do need to adapt to be able to be more flexible and I think as well um, their consumers are now expecting that you know they will be able to engage digitally they'll be able to do things remotely they don't have to go to people's offices they don't have to travel to meetings so I think there will be a, a whole change that will benefit um, companies who can react to that and be flexible um, and I suppose from from that side of things, um, we expect to be reasonably well positioned, um, you know, as we move forward um, with Brexit. Uh, that's a, a, I suppose, a whole unknown. <laughs> um, I, I'm not I'm not sure that the um, the government knows exactly what's going to be the next steps and things. So it's very difficult to predict. Um, I suppose our, our software is, um, supports companies um, through compliance and regulatory work. And I would assume, again, there will be changes within uh, regulations and changes within compliance, um, which will result in companies, again, needing to adapt and needing to look at how they service you know, the, their clients and how they manage that. So, again, I would assume technology will be you know, key to that. Um, and would hope that our software will help support companies with that. Um, but apart, yeah, apart from that, I think it's very hard to predict, I suppose, the longer term um, knock on effects, especially with Brexit, I think. Wonderful. Thank you. And I've got a final question that I want to pose to both of you. Um, really just as more of an insight following all your experiences. But what's what would you each say is your, your biggest uh, area of learning or, or the best piece of advice uh, that you can give as we move forward? I think um, it just in terms of, I mean, obviously I've been carrying out a number of interviews myself in regards to wellness on, on our podcast. And I think that one of the best things that came across from that was that, you know, wellness and well-being, it's not a tick box exercise. Um, it's not a case of just creating a document and sending things out to your employees. It is really about leadership and it's about mindset. Um, it's, you know, if you, whether you're doing things by the book according to, you know, a particular HR policy or whatever, people do not care. People do not care about that, don't bother. It's so much better that individual leaders are being empowered to support the well-being of their staff and, yes. I think that, you know, life and work has always been blended, but people are only just starting to acknowledge that, um, you know, uh, uh, only now because you can see the the back of my kitchen. Can you acknowledge that I have a life outside of Amicus? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like Amicus has always done a good job of that. But now that we can, we're all accepting of the fact that, that people have these lives outside of work, I feel like that has been one of the that will be one of the biggest influences on the way that that we work going forward and you know tick box well-being programs just aren't going to do the trick because people are going to be bringing their whole lives to work regardless but now more so than ever absolutely um, Richie same question uh, yeah I, I would I suppose echo slightly what, what Lisa's saying sorry Richie no we've lost him not to worry. Um, Say so if if we get them back, wonderful. Um, I, I think certainly what you're saying with the the tick box exercises and things like that, it, it makes such a vast difference um, because it becomes more personal and tailored rather. Hello. Than... Hello. Oh, have we got you. Yeah, sorry, I think it froze. Did it? Yeah, yeah we didn't I... hear any of that. <laughs> I think we've lost him. Um, OK, um, no, as I was saying, um, it's, uh, avoiding that tick box exercise and um, really focusing on kind of having an individual support system in place. Um, it, it, and if it's you leading it or the leaders themselves actually implementing change and support and, and making sure, again, those touch points are maintained. That's that's going to be the key thing, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
say, Richie, if, if we follow up, um, that'd be wonderful. But you've both been absolutely amazing in, in giving a true insight into what is such a difficult, difficult time for anyone to navigate. So thank you so much for that time. Um, what I will do now is, is obviously leave you to enjoy your day. Um, so hopefully I'll, I'll carry on with Richie at some point. But if you can thank him for me also, that would be wonderful.